If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. Hi, so I'm Ari Demesso, the High Priestess of the Reformed Satanic Church here at the Bitcoin Embassy, located in Key, New Hampshire, that's owned by the Shire Free Church. And I'm going to teach you how to sell Bitcoin, how to do what I do, because I'm pretty upfront about doing this. And the reason for that is, if you go into a bank with like $5,000 worth of cash, there's really only three explanations for that. You're either selling drugs, you're selling guns, or you're selling cryptocurrency. Only one of those is actually legal, so I prefer to be upfront about the fact that I'm selling Bitcoin rather than selling drugs or selling guns, which obviously I'm not. So the first step of this process is to understand Bitcoin. Well, what is Bitcoin? I'm not really going to explain it. That's not what this is about. The Bitcoin Embassy here in New Hampshire has seminars and classes and all that. If you want to learn about Bitcoin, I would recommend you do that. This, however, is just to teach you how to sell it if you have a basic understanding of it and how it works. If you don't have that understanding, uh, close out of this and go back and research Bitcoin, find out what it is, find out how it works, because you you'll instantly get in over your head. The first time one of your buyers has a problem, you won't have any idea how to assist them with it. Or if they send you an address that you know is not compatible with the pre, I can't think of the terminology now, but there was a fork a few months ago. So you, you have to have a general understanding of it. But once you do understand Bitcoin and you have a basic idea of how it works, the overall plan here is very, very simple. What you want to do is acquire Bitcoin at what we call market rate. This is the, this is the number you will get if you Google what is the price of Bitcoin. It's going to be within that. And that's the rate at which you want to buy it. And the reason you want to do that is because you then want to charge a 10% markup or an 8% or even a 5% markup so that if you buy $500 worth of Bitcoin, you sell it for $550, right? So the closer you can get to its market value, the more profit you can make. Now, there are a lot of ways to do this. But once you have the Bitcoin, and we're going to get momentarily into how to acquire the Bitcoin, you sell it using a site like localbitcoins.com or Paxful. Localbitcoins.com is preferable in my experience. Uh, there's nothing wrong with Paxful. I think it's Paxful.com. I don't remember the exact URL. But localbitcoins.com is where, where you'll get most of your action if you intend to do this seriously. After you have sold the Bitcoin, you will then turn around and repurchase the Bitcoin that you sold. So going back to our simplistic example, say you bought $500 worth of Bitcoin and you want to sell it for $550. Well, you would go to localbitcoins.com to do that and then you would go back to your exchange. And remember, we're going to get into this process momentarily of how to even buy Bitcoin because it's, it's simpler than you would expect. And you will repurchase the cryptocurrency that you sold. So if, if at current values, let's say it's $10,000, you'd sell 0 0.05 Bitcoin for $500, or $550 rather. You would take that 50, that's your profit, and you take the 500 and rebuy 0 0.05 Bitcoin. Now, the exchanges, is where all of this happens at. This is what well, it's not, it's about where half of it happens at, to be fair. This is where you go to get your cryptocurrency. Uh, they suck. That, that's the whole reason I'm doing this, is because the exchanges are every bit as bad as the fucking banks. They're inexcusably bad. See, in the, the way the world works is that banks control your money. And most people never really run into problems with this because the banking system is designed to allow people who are making ten to fifty thousand dollars a year fly under their radar without any problems but as soon as you start transacting in volumes that suggest you have more wealth than that you're going to start hitting ATM withdrawal limits wire transfer limits ACH limits bank transfer limits all kinds of limits they will control your ability to get your money out of their accounts out, yeah, and they are their accounts the your name is just on them but they are 100 percent their accounts and exchanges the places that have the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin Cash as of today, they want to become the new banks, telling you how much you can buy, how much you, how much USD you can send them, how much, how long you have to wait to get your Bitcoin out, how long, how much of that Bitcoin you can get out. So they're performing the roles today that banks were performing yesterday in controlling what you can do with your money. And if you're opposed to that, as you should be. 
But if you are opposed to that, then this is the best way to undermine this system. Because as it currently stands, if you dare, if you dare try to transition from that threshold that I was talking about, which is somewhere around ten to fifty thousand dollars a year, they, they don't bat an eye about that. But if you dare to trans transition into the next plateau of earning, they're going to close your accounts. They're going to freeze your assets. They're going to start hitting you with all kinds of limitations that you didn't even know previously existed. And it's all because they, they don't care. The banking system, the government that they work with, they don't care if you're poor. But if you try to not be poor, you're going to run into never-ending problems with them. Kraken, Coinbase, Binance, these are all exchanges, and they play ball with the state. What this, the state is a word I'm probably going to say a lot. That means the government, for those people out there who aren't anarchists. They're waging a war on financial freedom. The old financial system, the banks, as we were talking about, they utilize banks as the gatekeepers of wealth, as I was talking about just a moment ago. Controlling when you can get your money, how much of your money you can get, all of that kind of crap. Well, today with Bitcoin, which was created to get out of that entire system, because that entire system, let's not forget, caused the Great Recession of 2007. So it's not a good system, and it's actually largely thanks to the Great Recession that we have Bitcoin and cryptocurrency today. But Kraken, Coinbase, Binance, all these others, they want to undermine cryptocurrency. They, they don't care that cryptocurrency was designed so that the average person controls their own money. Instead, they want to control it for you. And what we want to do is change that. Now, everybody who has heard me talking about this probably has walked away with the impression that it's free, easy money. That could not possibly be further from the truth. But because by selling Bitcoin, by doing this, you're stepping into a war against the old financial system and the new financial system that is trying to rise up in its place. You're taking the side of cryptocurrency and its ideas, and you're taking that side. And that side is against both the exchanges and the banks. So you've got enemy, enemies on every front. There's constant challenges, difficulty, stress. There's no guide on how to handle those challenges. There's no walkthrough on the internet of, oh, I lost $3,500 from a scammer in Venezuela. How do I handle this? There's no guide for that. You just, it's all figure it out as you go. You can consult with me via aria at freetalklive.com if you run into some monumental task. Don't, don't be surprised if you message me something like, what is Bitcoin? And I ignore it. So just be aware of that. But some of the challenges you're going to face is, and I can't stress this enough, waking up to frozen bank accounts that show balances of negative $888,000. There are no words to describe what it feels like to wake up and see that in your banking app, or waiting for nine months for a bank to release your funds. Uh, I think I'm at 10 months now with one particular bank, and without being able to speak to a human being. There, a lot of these banks, have systems in place that prevent you from actually speaking to another human being. They prefer you to email or leave a voicemail and they'll call you back and then they never do. Again, I'm on probably about 10 months with one particular bank. Hoping a, hoping a bank takes your play side in a fraud dispute. Fraud disputes, it, it's, it's just going to happen. This is We're going to get into how you can protect yourself against them later, but you're going to get hit with a fraud dispute at some point. And you'll take your information to the bank, you'll take your evidence, you'll be like, see, look, no, I was 100% in the clear on this, and this other person is trying to steal from me. And the result of that, you have no control over. The bank may decide in your favor, they may decide in the other party's favor. There's really not much you can do about it. So step one of all of this, if, if you're okay with everything I just said, and you probably have already closed this video out because you're not okay with anything I just said, the first thing you want to do is create a new bank account. You do not want to use a bank account that you receive your alimony checks or your child support checks or your payroll checks through. You, you want to have that particular bank account separate from all of your Bitcoin stuff. And I say all of your Bitcoin stuff because you're going to go through multiple bank accounts doing this. And you don't need to lose access to like your paycheck when Bank of America or Wells Fargo or Citibank or JP Morgan Chase, when they say, hey, we're closing your account. Your debit card instantly gets frozen. It, it's a mess. So you don't want to lose access to all of your funds simultaneously. Create a new bank account. And again, uh, I can't stress this enough. They will close your account. It's not a matter of when. 
I mean, it's a matter of when and not a matter of if. It's going to happen. So there are a lot of banking options out there. How do you choose one? Online wire transfers are the, the biggest thing you want because that simplifies everything on your end. If you can't, wire transfers are how you're going to get your money onto the exchanges for the most part. And if you can't do that online, it means you have to either call, and most banks don't do phone transfers either, or actually go into the branch. And in my experience, going into the bank to send wire transfers multiple times a week is a recipe for failure. Uh, bank of America offers online wire transfers. Wells Fargo does for accounts that are older than six months. So you might as well go ahead and open a Wells Fargo account and have it six months from now that you can actually use. Of course, Wells Fargo has really terrible limits. Uh, Bank of America, I never ran into any of their wire transfer limits. But everything that I've done in the last year or so suggests that the, the less amount of time you spend interacting with other human beings inside of banks, the better. You want as many automated systems as possible. If your bank offers uh, cash deposits at ATMs, use that instead of going into a teller. If they offer online wire transfers, absolutely do that. Some of these banks do have you know, automated systems in place to make sure that you are who you say you are and things like that, but automated systems for the most part, they don't care how many wire transfers you send a week. So if something can be done online or at an ATM, do it online. If it can't be, then go into the branch, but try to aim for online banking. Step two, the exchanges that we talked about earlier, the Krakens, the Bitcoins, the Binances, the Coinbase. Uh, they're the enemies here. Uh, you have to use both of these enemies against each other while you're trying to come out ahead. It's, as I said, it's not free easy money, it's complicated. Uh, we have to use the banks and the exchanges to undermine the banks and the exchanges. So Coinbase is probably the most monolithic evil in the cryptocurrency world. They are the devil for all intents and purposes. But you do want a Coinbase account as a last resort because it's, it saved me repeatedly. I hate Coinbase, I hate everything about them, but when everything else fails, Coinbase miraculously still works for me. That's what I would recommend you use your Coinbase account for. Don't use it as your main purchasing account. Just have it there as a backup in case Kraken or Binance or somebody gets a wild hair up their ass and they're like, hey, we're closing your account. And they won't tell you why. They'll just do it. They'll give you 24 hours in most cases, 24 hours to move all of your money out of your account. Kraken, Binance.us, Paxos, Bit, Blockchain, there, there are a lot of exchanges out there. These are the ones I would recommend, more or less in this order. I've, I like Blockchain Exchange when they work, but they're giving me so much headache over a corporate account that I'm not sure it's worth it to even continue pursuing them. But these are your best bets. Kraken. Binance.us and Kraken, they're weird, but they're good. They're probably the most resisting of the exchanges that are listed here. Paxos, Itbit, they're a smaller one. They all have their ups and downs. They, they all suck for different reasons, and they're all good for different reasons. Uh, Kraken supports Monero. None of these others do. Paxos and Itbit, uh, blockchain, they're Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash only. So you have a lot of options there. Of course, if you're looking at this, chances are you're probably just interested in buying and selling Bitcoin, and all of these exchanges will do that. In order to ensure that they have control over crypto and why, exchanges have very various verification tiers. This means they'll need to see your ID. They'll need you, they'll, often they'll need to see a proof of address. They'll have some sort of stupid, ridiculous automated system in place that checks your face in your webcam and compares it to the face on your ID and all of this other crap. And then if you hit a certain threshold, they'll need to see W-2s, pay stubs, all that kind of crap. They have to, they quote, have to cover their asses so that the government doesn't come after them. But the truth of the matter is that they want the government to go after smaller exchanges that aren't playing by these rules instead and shut them down. Verification can take a while, so ideally once you're, when you're starting this, you'll get all of these balls rolling simultaneously because some of them will take a day, some of them will take two weeks, some of them will take months. But once verified, once you step through, jump through all of their stupid freaking hoops, it's time to fund your exchange account. So drop some money into the new checking account that you created, determine how much you want to put into the exchange account. 
So all you're doing is moving money from your bank account to your exchange account. There are several ways to do this. Uh, ACH, is, I think it stands for Automatic Clearinghouse or something like that. It, it's the checking system process, I guess, is what, if you write someone a check, it's ACH, basically. And you can also do it online. Uh, it, it sucks. It's slow. Uh, most banks don't limit your ACH transfers, though, although a lot of the exchanges do, like Binance.us. You can only transfer $5,000 per day via ACH. Of course, your bank itself will allow you to transfer as much as you freaking want, as long as you don't, you know, overdraft your account. But the exchanges often do have ACH transfers. And you can increase these over time, like Coinbase, it starts out like $2,000 a week, but they go up to $5,000 a week, $6,000 a week, and occasionally $5,000 a day. There's also debit. Uh, I would highly recommend against this. Uh, Coinbase at least takes debit cards. It's the only one I've ever done it through, so I don't know if any of the others do as well. But um, it, it sucks. It's got very, very high fees. You may, there's always going to be fees. If you buy $500 worth of Bitcoin from Coinbase using ACH, your fee is probably going to be like $17. But if you do it via debit, your fee is going to be closer to $40 or $50. So avoid debits. Wire transfers are, that's where you get the bang for the buck. Um, there's three tiers. There's send today, send the next day, and send within three business days. Uh, they vary at, by price at different banks. Uh, some of them are $3 for the three-day option. It's usually $30 to send instantly. And instantly means within the next few hours a lot of times. <laughs> it doesn't mean instantly. Uh, often, as we pointed out, you have to actually go to the branch to do this, and that's always a red flag. So you've got your money, you've chosen your payment method of how you're going to get the money to the, to the banks, and most exchanges, back to the previous point, most exchanges do have some sort of fee they charge for processing a wire transfer. It's usually just like $5 or something like that. It's, it's negligible in the grand scheme of things. So now you've let's say $500 because that's a really simple number to use, you've set aside $500 that you're going to use to begin buying and selling Bitcoin. So you've opened your new checking account, you've used ACH or wire transfer at an amount like that, ACH is better because there are no fees. You don't want to pay $30 to spend, send $500. I mean, that's, that's stupid. So just be patient, use ACH to transfer it. So let's say you set aside this $500 and you've You've moved the $500 to the exchange. Great. You don't want to turn. You don't want to immediately take that $500 and buy $500 worth of Bitcoin, though, because you need to be able to rebuy whatever you sell. So you have to basically split whatever you send in half. Use $250 to buy Bitcoin. Keep the rest, the other $250, on the exchange that you're using. That way, when you sell that $250 worth of Bitcoin, you can just open up the exchange and rebuy the Bitcoin that you sold. So that's the basics of that. The Craigslist of Bitcoin is what localbitcoins.com effectively is. Uh, it allows you to create an offer. A user will come along and they will attempt to complete a trade with you because you're not selling Bitcoin. You're trading Bitcoin to them and they're trading cash to you. That's the actual transaction going on here. Uh, Localbitcoins.com is the best place for this. Complete all of their identity verification. That there's three tiers of this. There's tier one, tier two, and tier three. You'll more than likely never need to go through tier three. Uh, tier three is a bit invasive and stupid, but tier tier two will allow you to sell, I think it's 200,000 euros worth of Bitcoin, and the equivalent of that in dollars is like 170,000 or something. So $170,000 a year is about the amount of Bitcoin that you can expect to sell at localbitcoins.com before you run into any major issues. So create your listing. I'm not going to step you through this. Uh, you should understand the basics of how to sell a thing online. I'm not going to step you through it. And you should know enough about what you're selling to be able to do this. It's got a number of fields there. You put the hours that you're going to be available. If, you're, if you are even remotely tech savvy and you're familiar with buying and selling things online, th th this part is simple. So I'm not going to step you through it. Plus, if something goes wrong, I'm not going to be responsible for it. I'm not going to be responsible for anything that goes wrong in your life. Don't listen to me if you're worried about that. 
Local Bitcoins requires a certain amount of Bitcoin to be in your wallet before your listing is displayed. And this is the reason why I wasn't using it for such a long period of time. I think it's like 0 0.04 Bitcoin though, so it's like $400 worth of Bitcoin. It's not a major amount, but be aware of it. $500 probably is not enough to get you started with LocalBitcoins.com. I don't know, but it's probably not. There are other sites that you can use to buy, excuse me, to sell Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And I'm not going to get into the difference between Bitcoin, Cash, Monero, all any of these. But local.bitcoin.com is where you want to go to sell Bitcoin Cash. Uh, it's a great site. It, there's no KY, no know your customer KYC requirements. You don't have to give them your ID. You don't have to do any verification with them. But this also means that neither do scammers. So be aware that you're going to run into a higher percentage of scammers there. Just be careful. Make sure that you're actually paid before you release the coins. Localmonero.co uh, is where you can sell Monero. I've never actually used it, but it exists, and it's an option. I think all of the offers there are cash by mail, though, and that, that, which means, yes, you're sending and receiving cash via the U.S. Postal Service or FedEx or something. Paxful, I'm not sure what all they support. It may just be Bitcoin. It may be Bitcoin Cash. It may be Monero. I don't know. It seems like this type of site would have... Uh, support for multiple cryptocurrencies, but who knows? Uh, there are others, but I wouldn't personally stray very far from this list. If I, if localbitcoins.com, for example, just closes my account, I would just go to Paxful. I wouldn't just get online and Google, where can I sell Bitcoins? That, that's, that's a terrible idea. So the, these are probably the most reliable, the most solid. So, Creating your listing to return to this and get into a little bit of detail about it and how it works. You need to decide what payment methods you want to accept for Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash or Monero or whatever. None of these are risk free. Um, they, people on these sites are used to paying higher rates for Bitcoin. And I know you're wondering, well, why would they buy Bitcoin from me at a 10% markup when they can just do this first part? and send the money to the exchanges and buy it themselves at market rate. I don't know why. I don't care why. It's not my business. It's a fact of life that they are willing to do it. Some of them will pay through Cash App or what is listed on local Bitcoins as Square Cash. What's really weird about Cash App payments is that you can buy Bitcoin directly from Cash App at not bad rates. Uh, Zelle is supported by most major banks. It's an instant money transfer service, very similar to PayPal, except there are no fees whatsoever, and it's instant. So even at 2 o'clock in the morning, if you see, if you receive a Zelle payment, it's going to show up in your bank account instantly. There's also bank transfer, wire transfers. Uh, th those are, these two are going to get your bank accounts closed, 100%, at, at eventually. Google Pay, Google Wallet, Square, Cash App, they're going to get your Cash App account and your Google Pay accounts closed, but the bank accounts that you're actually using behind them aren't likely to be closed. Uh, that's because Cash App and Google Pay, one of their biggest drawbacks is that they have no fraud dispute department at all. If somebody files a dispute with Cash App, if you sell them $1,000 of Bitcoin via Cash App and they file a dispute, Cash App is just going to take $1,000 out of your bank account and give it back to that person. There's no appeals process. There's no, hey, wait, no. Here's the proof that this person was trying to buy this from me. There's none of that. The same with Google Pay. Uh, there's also uh, cash deposits at banks. Most banks won't even allow this. If you have a business account, your options are expanded a bit. But uh, I would avoid cash deposits. And I, I would generally avoid wire transfers if I had an option. But the, there aren't a lot of really good ways to move cash around that are safe and secure. So you're, you've decided what method you want to accept. Of course, there's Venmo and PayPal and all of these. PayPal will shut you down so fast that you, you won't be able to do anything with it. Um, and they own Venmo as well. So Venmo and PayPal are both things to be avoided if possible. But you want to know what your competition is doing. If you're selling via Cash App or Square Cash, you, you want to go in and undercut your competitors. And once you are established as a seller on the site, 
it, will, it won't matter what other people are charging. You can just set your rates and people will come to you either because you have a great reputation or they've already done business with you. But when you're starting, you need that reputation. So you, you need to undercut your competitors. For Cash App, I've seen it get as high as 16% and as low as 5%. But even if you're only making 4% off a transaction, I would recommend you do it simply to build up your reputation on the site. Each day when you, when you unpause your listings or when you wake up and your listings automatically unpause, however you have it set up, check what your competitors have their rates set at and undercut them again. And if you can increase your rates because some of the competitors aren't online, go ahead and increase your rates. If people are willing to pay it, you might as well. I mean, don't leave money sitting on the table. Also, check out what KYC, again, let's know your customer, is doing to protect themselves from scammers and fraudsters. Now, you'll find a lot of people selling with Cash App or Google Pay that require first-time buyers to submit their ID and a note certifying that they're buying this amount of Bitcoin for this amount of US dollars. It doesn't help, but it may cause the scammers on the other ends to refuse to try to jump through all of those hoops. And a lot of the times they can't because they're executing men in the middle of attacks, which means that there is some third party out here that is trying to buy something from the scammer, like a truck or something. And the scammer says, okay, it's $500. You can buy this old beat up truck. The scammer then opens up a trade with you trying to buy $500 worth of Bitcoin. The scammer then tells them, okay, I need you to send $500 beat to cash tag Bitcoin seller one, and you receive the money from that third party. You release the Bitcoin to the scammer, and six weeks later, you have a fraud dispute, and Cash App comes along and just takes the money out of your account. But if you have the proper KYC in place, and look, all of these places KYC, Kraken, banks, they all, so do, so do I. The difference is, I encrypt the information and store it and will never, ever turn it over to a government or to the IRS or to anyone else. Uh, these, these guys will. Uh, the other sellers on localbitcoins.com probably wouldn't either, but you can have whatever terms you want. If you want to just take payments from people without seeing their IDs, without caring who's sending the money, you can certainly do that. Your accounts won't last long and you'll lose money in the long run. You'll lose money in the short term too. but. Ideally, you will want to require an ID and a selfie of them holding a note saying that I name and buy X amount of Bitcoin for YUSD from local Bitcoin's username on this date. I understand this cannot be refunded or reversed. That's generally the best way to protect yourself against fraud because the scammers out there, we were talking about men in, men in the middle attacks a moment ago, the scammer has no way of explaining to the third party why this note they're supposed to write says they're buying Bitcoin when it should say they're buying a truck. That's usually what catches up the scammers. But once you have your terms in place, don't ever let someone slide on your terms because it's 100% guarantee they're a scammer. If you require to see their ID and they're like, no, I don't have my ID, I, I left it at a friend's house, cancel the trade. Well, you can't actually cancel the trade, but you can let it time out. Your terms are there. They're listed on the site. By opening the trade with you, they're agreeing to your terms. Do not slide on your terms. I don't care if they bought from you before. If you require that note that we were just talking about, that's for every single transaction. If they buy $500 and they would come back two hours later to buy $500 more, you need a new note. And start having them put the time on it, time on it in that case so that you can distinguish the two in the event of a fraud dispute. Of course, at local.bitcoins.com where you buy and sell Bitcoin cash, a lot of people are going to balk at having to give you their ID and stuff like that, but people at local Bitcoins, they're already used to giving their IDs and selfies. They're used to all of this crap, so none of this is going to catch them as particularly intrusive. And these photographs, if you're doing something directly through a bank like wire transfers or cash deposits or Zelle or whatever, the, those photographs will actually help you when you take them to the bank as evidence of your side of the claim. Because all that other person could say was either, I didn't know that this transaction was happening, or I didn't receive the product. And you can prove that they received the Bitcoin, right? And you can prove that they knew they were going into the bank, and that they knew they were sending you money, or wiring you money, or whatever, in order to purchase Bitcoin. And 
you would have their ID to match it up with their face and the selfie of them holding that note. So you can prove all, everything you need to prove your case. Sometimes it won't work, but if you have all of that evidence, it should. Now you have to choose your rate as you're creating your listing. Typically, 8% is probably the lowest you'll want to go, and that should be for your most secure payment methods. Now, there is one exception to this. 5% uh, five, five for cash in hand is, from what I can tell, pretty customary. If someone has cash in their hand and they're like, hey, I want to buy $100 worth of Bitcoin, unless it's a counterfeit bill, it's pretty rock solid. There's no need, you're not at risk of losing any money in that particular example. Higher risk payment methods like Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, Google Pay, they typically have higher fees. Uh, cash in hand, 5% because it's very, very low risk. However, sending money online with Google Pay and Cash App or something like that, you need to be able to make enough profit to absorb the inevitable loss that you're going to receive as a result of some scammer or fraudster. They'll file that dispute and you'll lose $500. So you need to have rates high enough that will allow you to absorb that loss. Otherwise, I mean, it could happen that your very first sell at localbitcoins.com is to a scammer. Um, that would suck, but it could happen. So once you've verified that you have received the payment, you, you've created the listing, somebody has opened this trade for you, they're trying to buy your $250 worth of Bitcoin for $275, or whatever it would come out to you. I don't know how they calculate it. You want to make sure that the payment is in your account. Don't take their word for it that they sent the money. Don't even take their little screenshot evidence as proof that they sent the money. Until you open your bank account or your cash app or whatever, you see that your balance has increased by the amount that they were supposed to send, do not release the Bitcoin. You won't run into any issues at the site with this because they tell you to never release the money until you're 100% certain that the buyer has paid you. Localbitcoins.com, local.bitcoin.com, they all say this. They don't want the sellers out there to lose money as a result of fraudsters. And it's super easy to fake a screenshot. This is a fake cash app payment I was sent um, several months ago. I don't remember how long ago it was now. Oh, there it is. It was March 17th. Now, I, re I did not receive the payment, and this guy posted the screenshot. And I just kept looking and he, he became very angry, very irate, saying that I was a scammer and all this other stuff. So I filed a dispute and then I realized that there's something off about this. There's something just slightly off. That A shouldn't be there. That should be a selfie that I use for cash out. And I knew as soon as I realized that I had a friend send me a test payment and screenshot the verification so that I can compare it to this one and sure enough, my face was right there. This letter A, that's the generic one for people who never uploaded a pic. So what he did was he, I don't know, probably sent $100 to his brother or his cousin or something, and he edited all of this in. Or he edited this part in, using the generic A that they use there. You have to be on the lookout for stuff like that. Of course, I was waiting for my cash app balance to increase by $100, so there was no chance I was going to release it until that actually happened. So how do you identify scammers? Well, first of all, payments won't appear on your end in 99% of cases. Uh, there are often legitimate delays. Uh, a lot of times, if people don't use Zelle frequently, or if this is their first Zelle transaction, the bank will automatically <clears throat> put a fraud alert on the account to make them call and verify that yes, they did intend to send it, no, their account isn't hacked, all of that stuff. That's a legitimate delay. You can't do anything about that. It's usually automatic fraud prevention, and it's by and large a, a good thing. Honest users, when this happens, when somebody says that they sent you money and it's not appearing on your end, you can say, well, because these payment methods are instant, like Zelle, it's instant. You say, well, it's not appearing on my end. You probably need to contact your bank and verify that you intend to do, the, to do that. Honest users will actually contact their bank. They'll say, hold on, I'm going to call them now. Or, the, it's 6 o'clock at night, my bank isn't open, I will call them first thing in the morning. Scammers will get pissed off, and they'll start accusing you of being a thief or a scammer. That's almost universally true. I've never run into a scammer who attempted this and then was like, oh, okay, actually I did on one particular occasion. Um, and that, that's an ongoing mess. But most scammers will just become angry and irate and they'll start 
threatening you to foul disputes and all of this other nonsense. Just don't give in to these intimidation tactics. Open the dispute if they threaten to. Don't put up with their crap. This comes back to never giving in on your terms. Uh, have boundaries and make people respect those boundaries. And one of your boundaries should be that you do not give in to intimidation tactics. If they're threatening you with calling the police or whatever, tell them to call the police. If they're threatening to file a dispute, file a dispute. The best advice here, uh, let's go ahead and read that several times. Don't be an idiot. All of these sites tell you themselves not to accept a screenshot as proof of payment and to only release when you see the money in your account. Now, this is still true with Google Pay and Cash App and Venmo and PayPal and all of these other that automatically side with the person who sends the money instead of the person who receives the money. But at least then they have to actually file a dispute, right? And ideally, you would know when that was going to happen. You, you sort of develop a sixth sense for these kind of things. And you would move money out of, you would unlink them from your bank account preferably. Uh, open a dispute when this happens and send the screenshots that you have not received payment. This means screenshotting your Cash App history or whatever and sending it to the admins. They're like, look, this person says they sent $100. Here's their screenshot. Here's the reason why their screenshot isn't correct. Here's what their screenshot should look like if they had sent me $100. And here's my screenshot showing that they have not. I have never lost a dispute at localbitcoins.com or local.bitcoin.com because I, I tend to be honest. If, if, if someone has paid me, I'm going to freaking release their Bitcoin, right? So you've completed this sale. You've verified the money is in your account. You've sold $250 worth of Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash for $275. Fantastic. But what now? Well, now you want to go back to the exchange that you initially sent $500 to, and you want to buy the amount of Bitcoin that you sold. As of today's value, whenever I made this, that would be something like 0.047 Bitcoin. That's the number that you're interested in buying. You're not going to turn around and buy $250 worth of Bitcoin. Ideally, if you do this quickly enough, then you could buy $250 worth of Bitcoin and get back this correct amount. But Bitcoin fluctuates, obviously. Sometimes it'll go down, sometimes it'll go up. If you put in 250, you may end up buying too much Bitcoin, which isn't a problem, or too little Bitcoin, which would be a problem. So you buy back your 0 0.0247 Bitcoin, Again, buy the Bitcoin amount, not the USD amount, and withdraw this newly repurchased Bitcoin to whatever wallet you're using to sell from. That's probably going to be localbitcoins.com or Paxful or whatever. And then take that $275. Uh, I would not take your profit, put profit out at this point. I would just send the 275 back to the exchange. That way you can sell the 250 that you removed and immediately rebuy it back. So it's, it's like a giant circle. Uh, do this, more or less, you, you buy Bitcoin, you sell it, you rebuy it, you resell it, you rebuy it. Do that uh, until a bank or an exchange closes your account, really, because that's going to happen. And then go to a different bank or a different exchange, whichever is necessary. If Kraken can close your account, go to Binance. If Binance does it, go to blockchain. If Bank of America closes your account, go to Wells Fargo, go to Chase Manhattan, whatever they're called, and then do it all again until the new bank or exchange closes your account, and then so on and so on, because all of this is inevitable. They're going to close your accounts if you reach those numbers that we were talking about earlier. So the will of crypto selling is you send USD to a bank account. You normally just take the cash in to deposit it to do that. I mean, that's pretty standard. You should have a pretty good idea how to do that. Then you get the bank account USD onto the exchange, either by ACH, wire transfer, or God forbid, debit. You use the Bitcoin, use the USD on the exchange to buy Bitcoin. You then send the Bitcoin to localbitcoins.com and you sell it at a higher rate because you can you can buy it from these exchanges at market value, uh, give or take. Some of them are like 0.0001% higher than others, but it's not enough to matter in the long run. But you're selling it at 10% over markup. You can get it from the exchanges at, with no markup, so do that. The buyer then sends the USD to your bank account, which you then send back to the exchange. You buy more Bitcoin, you sell it, and you just rinse and repeat. 
other advice I have is to keep records using spreadsheets. This will allow you to keep track of how much in additional USD and Bitcoin you're accumulating versus how much you're selling. It'll, it'll help also help you keep from making mistakes. I've had times where I accidentally re released uh, Trader A's cryptocurrency when I meant to release Trader B's cryptocurrency. Th this was almost a year ago. And having the spreadsheet helps with that because I have the little note there saying, hey, the KYC for this trade is, I don't know, Trader A, not Trader B. That way when I go back to the site, I can look and there's Trader A. Dedicate a specific day for pulling out your, quote, profits. Uh, don't spend the profits regularly and don't just do it every day. Dedicate like one day a week to say, okay, I did this every single day. I made $25 a day doing it, uh, $125 Monday through Friday, let's say that. I want to take out, I don't know, 60 of that and use the other 60 to buy additional Bitcoin so that I can then sell more Bitcoin. I don't care. That's up to you how you want to do it. But don't do it every day and don't spend money out of your checking account. That's just a bad idea. And uh, don't ever sell to someone who wants to tell you why they want the Bitcoin. This has all kinds of problems with it. Uh, it's not your business, first of all, even if the reason is innocuous, like they just want to go down to the burger place that accepts Bitcoin. Don't sell it to them. Because the kind of person who tells you that they want Bitcoin to buy a burger is the same kind of person who will tell you they want Bitcoin to buy heroin or guns or whatever. And you, you just don't need it in your life. So as soon as someone tells you why they want the Bitcoin, end your relationship with them. You will encounter scammers, obviously, and scammers are always devising new schemes. It's, it's very similar to the malware versus anti-malware war that's happening. You know, you have the, the malware writers out there trying to find, devise new ways around the anti-malware's walls and all of that. And you have the anti-malware trying to adapt to these and to predict what these scammers are going to do. You have to learn scammers' behavior. You have to devise systems that will allow you to prevent them from stealing your money. And they're always trying to come up with new and ingenious ways to steal people's money. You always have to come up with new and interesting ways to keep them from stealing your money. Uh, it calls some poor person... Yeah, I skipped ahead a bit. Don't feel guilty if you get hit by a scammer. Never, ever, ever feel guilty about it. Uh, I've had people say this before, back when I took cell payments without requiring any ID or anything like that. Like, but there are old men and old women being defrauded so that you can sell your bitcoins. Well, wait a minute. Because all they have to do is go file a dispute with their bank. And at this point, I had no evidence from my side whatsoever because I wasn't taking it. And they will get their money back. The only person who loses money when you get scammed selling Bitcoin, it's going to be you. You're the only person who's ever going to lose money. So don't feel guilty. Feel angry, if anything. It caused some poor person who was scammed a hassle, but you're going to be the only one who actually loses money from it. There's, as I said, you always have to stay ahead of what these scammers are doing. It's a never-ending learning experience. They're always coming up with new ways to scam people, getting their phone numbers, claiming to be from Apple support. It, it gets insane. Uh, this is the closest you're going to get on how to, on a, for a guide on how to deal with these things. And I've told you very little about how to deal with these things because it's, it's just knowledge that you have to build up by doing it. Again, tragic though it could be, your first skill could in fact be to a scammer and it could immediately sink you. So be aware of that. It's not likely. By and large, you know, the trades I've had have been you know, from up front, above the board, trustworthy people. But there's no foolproof method of avoiding scammers, fraudsters, or just plain thieves. I wish I could tell you how to do that, but I don't because I don't know. I've been hit by fraudsters and scammers and thieves before. Go with your gut feelings. If you're trading with someone and something doesn't feel right, then it's not right. Have included in your terms that if anything seems off about this trade, you're not going to proceed with it. And if something feels off, just refuse to proceed. It's in your terms, they agreed to it. Last uh, bit of advice, 
any income tax liability you have from this, that, that's up to you to sort out. That's between you and the IRS. I don't, I don't know whether it's applicable or not because I operate for the Reformed Satanic Church, which is a tax-exempt religious organization. Uh, you can start a Reformed Satanic Church chapter, I suppose, or whatever you wish to do, but if you're just buying and selling for a business, um, you're going to run into all kinds of anti-money money laundering laws and all kinds of crap like that if you're trying to do that anyway, but let's say you jump through all those hoops, you're going to have some tax liability. And even if you're just doing it personally, you're technically going to have some sort of income tax liability because you are making income by doing it. I can't help you with that. Um, that's between you and the IRS. So we didn't get much turnout here in person, but does anyone have any questions? Well, thanks for listening. I do probably intend to do this again. I dropped the ball on planning the actual in-person event, so I don't know. I'm pretty booked up for the next two months. It'll probably be in August before I can revisit it. But if you have any questions for me, again, hit me with them at freetalklive.com, and I will do my best to assist you. I hope this was helpful, and I hope you can join us in taking on the banks and the exchanges. Thank you. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.